Life is a mysterious and exciting affair, and anything can be a thrill if you know where to look for it and what to do with the opportunity when it comes along. That was a quote from Clarence Darrow's summation of the Massey case, 1932. But wait, we're just beginning. Clarence Darrow had the gift of words. His summations were monumental lectures to packed houses and later on radio. These orations would go on sometimes for days. He was so convincing a speaker that courtrooms became lecture halls. He was to American law what Abraham Lincoln, another country lawyer, was to the Republic of the United States, revered, but more importantly, remembered. To this day, Clarence Darrow is one of the most quoted criminal attorneys of the 20th century. To many who practice law, he was the single reason why they went to law school and became lawyers. They are among us today. Some would brush him off as just a relic of the past. He was even accused of bribery and talked his way out of it. But first, let's go back near the beginning of his career. It's 1902 and Darrow is speaking to prisoners in Chicago's Cook County Jail. I do not believe there is any sort of distinction between the real moral conditions of the people in or out of jail. When I was a young lawyer back in Ohio, handling my first case, which concerned the ownership of a certain prize hog, we went to trial on that hog. The judge in the case ordered the hog be set free from its pen to run, knowing full well that hog would run to his property. I learned that day there is no justice, either in or out of court. The people here can no more help being here than the people outside can avoid being outside. I do not believe that people are in jail because they deserve to be. They are in jail simply because they cannot avoid it on account of circumstances which are entirely beyond their control and for which they are no way legally responsible. The good people outside will tell you, you should be good and then you will become rich by being good and needed the money. But when I want to heat or light my house, the gas or electric company holds me up. They charge me one dollar for something that is worth 25 cents. Still, all these people are good people. They are pillars of society and support the churches, and they are respectable. Hanging men in our county jails does not prevent murder. It makes murderers. The jail is a blot upon any civilization. And a jail is an evidence of the lack of charity of the people on the outside who make the jails and fill them with the victims of their greed. Too radical, one prisoner said. And Darrow's friends told him, Clarence, your theories may be true, but you should have never told them to prisoners in jail. Perhaps not, but was it his belief in Mother Liberty that caused him to go and do the many things that he chose to do? In the great flood of human life that spawned upon the earth, it is not often that a real man is born, one who seeks that one perfect thing, and then he dedicates himself to it. Liberty, oh, liberty is the most jealous and exacting of mistresses. She can beguile the brain and soul of man. She knows that his pretended love serves but to betray. But when once the fierce heat of her quenchless, lustrous eyes has burned into the victim's heart, he will know no other smile but hers. 
liberty will have none but the great devoted souls. And by her glorious visions, her lavish promises, her boundless hopes, her infinitely witching charms, she lures her victims over hard and stony ways, desolate and dangerous paths, through misery to a martyr's cruel death. The words tell us much about the man, but his deeds truly made him great. In 1898, a strike in the door and blind industry in Wisconsin found charges filed against Thomas Kidd, the general secretary of the Amalgamated Woodworkers International Union. He acted as picket captain during the 14-week strike. He was charged with others of criminal conspiracy to injure the business of the Pine Lumber Company. In Darrow's argument, the question that he posed was simple. Quote, can a body of men desiring to benefit their conditions and the conditions of their fellow men strike, and if they do, can they be jailed? He begins his argument by placing this question in the realm of the bigger question. Gentlemen, this is not a criminal case, but an episode in the great battle for human liberty, a battle which was commenced when the tyranny and oppression of man first caused him to impose upon his fellow man, and which will not end so long as the children of one father shall be compelled to toil to support the children of another in luxury and ease. He offers all who hear him, including the jury, a moral lesson. Your Honor, I understand full well the elements of terror and lawlessness and crime that were present in that wild, tumultuous crowd. I look back at the men and women and the little children gathered there, the Americans, Bohemians, Germans, Austrians, each with their native tongues whose combined voice was like the babbling of the waves of the sea. And I know that no man was responsible for the turbulent, surging, rising floods. I knew it was but an incident in a great struggle which commenced so many centuries ago and which will and must continue until human liberty is secured and equality has come to dwell on this earth. Darrow begins to point out that what Thomas Kidd did was not a crime. <sighs> Gentlemen, Kidd is brought into court because he is good. Ordinarily, men are brought into a criminal court for the reason that they are bad. Kidd did not take their dirty gold. Kid is a defendant in these criminal proceedings because he loves his fellow man. This is not the first case, and I'm afraid it will not be the last. It is not the first time that evil men, men who are themselves criminals, have used the law for the purpose of bringing righteous ones to death or to jail. And so long as this great battle is waged, these incidents will continue to mark the history of the labor strife. There is a conspiracy, dark and damnable. Somebody is guilty of one of the foulest conspiracies that ever disgraced a free nation. There are criminals in this case who have not been guilty of the crime of conspiring to save their fellow man, but criminals who have conspired against the very framework of those institutions that have made these same criminals great and powerful. Darrow, in a two-day summation, made a point. In his defense of the Union men, Darrow was determined to show that the state was not actually the complainant in the case, but it was the owner of the lumber company that caused the district attorney to file the complaint. Oh, it was not enough that the owner should impart his spies into this town to dog and destroy and incite them. It was not enough that they should go back to work as best they could. 
but when all is past and gone, he dares to take the law into his polluted hands, the law which should be holy and above suspicion, and which was made to protect him and to protect you and me, and to take this law and use it as a dagger to stab these men to death. Now, I do not want you to mistake our position in this case. I am not appealing to you for Thomas Kidd. I am appealing to you for the stunted men and suffering women and dependent children who cannot speak. I appeal for them and not for him. And I say, gentlemen, their lives, their future, their very happiness is in your keeping as much as they were in his. Here and there, all through the past, these men, men like Kid, have come, and in the future, they will come again. They will come to move the world onward and upward. They will come beckoning their fellow men to follow in their lead. They will point to a sunrise far away, so distant that the ordinary mortal cannot see, but which is clear to their prophetic eye. Darrow's closing arguments were a sociological treatise in simple and direct words, a history of trade unions and the struggle of the downtrodden. Before we leave this fight for better working conditions, let us visit Darrow in strike arbitration. It is Pennsylvania, 1903, and the anthracite miners' strike. 150,000 miners walked off the job. They wanted a 20% increase in pay, from $1.50 a day to $1.75. President Theodore Roosevelt stepped in when the mine operators agreed to arbitration. Darrow was appointed to the board representing labor. On February 13, 1903, Darrow began his summation. Gentlemen, how does this case stand? Practical businessmen, sensible men all, men who stood against the very tide of progress and who boldly said to those in their employ, we will do nothing further for you. We will pay you no higher wages. We will not submit your disputes to any body of men, secular or clerical. We will post our notices upon our doors, and that shall be your contract. We give you notice that for one year your wages are so-and-so, and that is all. Why was this all deferred for a year until 750,000 men women and children were brought to the brink of starvation and this country was facing the most terrible fuel calamity it has ever known yet we are met here today with these same gentlemen who after all these long and weary months refused to know us have demanded as a condition that these men must give up their union come to them with their hat in their hand, each one in a position to be discharged the next moment if they dare to raise their voice. The question is, are these men entitled to more money? Are they entitled to shorter work hours? As reasonable human beings, should we recognize the union or should we run against it like a stone wall and still swear we did not know it was there? It is here to stay, and the burden is on you, not upon us. The practical question to be answered is, you refuse to raise our wages because you say we are criminals. I say that you are carrying on your business in direct conflict with the spirit and the letter of the Constitution of the great commonwealth in which you live. If we work for you, 
It is not your moral character we're interested in. It is your dollars. That is all. We are not interested in how well you come up to the commandments. We take you as we find you. If we did not, we could not take you at all. And we only ask of you what our day's work is worth. He could be harsh. As the strike became worse, many people across the country boycotted the coal company. We must ask, is it fair to stop buying services and products from that company? If it please the court, in this case, from one end of the country to the other, men were taking sides. The poor were sending their wages to keep the miners out on strike while the rich were asking for soldiers to shoot them down. I must be on one side or the other. I love my side, and I hate the other. If a conflict is deep enough, these two rival camps live separate and distinct from each other, and the boycott is there naturally. Here, is the distinction which the criminal law makes. If I, out of malice to John Smith, and the criminal law must look to the human heart, for it is a maximum of the criminal law, that there can be no crime unless the heart is criminal. If I, out of malice to him, seek to get others to stay away from him, to destroy him, that is a crime. But if I, for the defense of myself, for the defense of my race, for the defense of what I believe are the rights of man, see fit to avoid John Smith, then I have the right to avoid him. And he has the right to avoid me. Let us now look at the man himself, caught and accused of bribery after an especially hard-fought trial. The Los Angeles Times building was bombed in 1910. Scores were killed and injured. Two labor activists were arrested for the crime. Darrow was accused of trying to bribe one of the jury members, and a quick settlement was forced. At the time, unions were pushing to make Los Angeles a closed town, while the Times owner, General Harrison Gray Otis, a notoriously anti-union advocate, was leading exponents for an open shop. Wrongdoing came from both sides, and fast talking was the order of the day for the people versus Clarence Darrow. I was a child once. I knew what it was like to be young. The young get less comfort out of life. The fact is, we are young, we expect too much. We haven't the experience to temper our emotions. If it rains today, then the child will not temper his emotions with the fact that tomorrow the sun will shine. When I was still a child, I worked for one day hoeing potatoes in the hot fields of Ohio. I put down that hoe. I was nine. I began learning to practice the law. And that was the last day of real work I ever did. A man knows the human mind is much stronger than the human back. I was a bit younger than most when I made that discovery. Later we hear Darrow speak about how he became involved in the Times bombing case. Your Honor, once again, labor interests uh, had called me in to defend two prominent organizers. The bombing of the Los Angeles Times building on October 1st, 1910, was in all the news all around the world. I was asked by representatives of the union to represent them. I was not eager to defend these men. In fact, I wished not to be involved, suggested others they might do a better job. 
But when I heard more about the nature of the case, I certainly relented. Darrow is once again placed in the middle of history, still being made. The headlines read, Unionist Bombs by Organized Labor. The court knows the new century was city wild and sentiments on both sides of this case were charged. The people of this city wanted the men responsible to be found and punished. They wanted blood and they would do anything to get it. In this case, it was two men, two prominent labor organizers, John and Jim McNamara. The facts, what there were, seemed to point to them. But when I say they got them, I mean a group of thugs was hired to cross state lines and kidnap them and forcibly drag them from their Midwestern homes to Los Angeles to stand trial. But it did not stop there. It most certainly did not stop there. Then the prosecutor said he had every right to raise a case against these men, to gather evidence, to seek information proving their guilt in this matter. Yes, the prosecution has, but to what limit, I ask, if Your Honor will answer this question? then I must also ask, to what limit can the defense go in the aid of its clients? The question is, how intensely can the defense counsel work to defend its clients? Can the defense do the things the prosecution did? Or are there limits that are placed on one side that do not apply to the other? Your Honor, the time and the place were charged. There was no canon of ethics. It was like a street fight. The prosecution was allowed to spit, bite, gouge, while the defense was obliged to keep within the strict rules of the pugilist. We legitimize what we do by imposing rules. The prosecution hired people to place in my own employment, to follow me, to chart my moves, to uncover every stone, to buy, to fabricate, to do whatever it needed to get these two men my clients at the end of a hangman's noose. In the course of the trial, I was accused of bribery. Some say, in exchange for getting out of trouble, that the McNamara's were forced to bargain for their lives and enter a guilty plea. I might argue, and you might ask, sir, does one wrong forgive another? The McNamara's were sent to prison and I am smeared in the press, placed in the trash, waiting for the incinerator. But that was not enough revenge. Believe me, revenge was called for. Things are not going well for Darrell. He has fired his counsel because of the man's bizarre behavior in court. For the first time, it looks like he's going to lose, and it's in his own case. He must find a way to turn the jury. Your Honor, did you think I wanted that man to represent me any longer? After his unruly display in your courtroom? He was not respectful. I begged the court's indulgence. I was depressed, yes. But I couldn't stand what was happening to me and to this court. I was seeing myself on trial and represented by a buffoon. The people will want to hear from me, and hear me they will. I promise you that. The prosecution objected, and the judge said, the court will, when necessary, recognize the prosecuting attorney. However, the court will now acknowledge the accused and enter him as the legal representative. Thank you, Your Honor. Would the court permit me to tell this story in my own way? The judge said, the court will make an observation here. A client and an attorney both might be fools if they are one. Uh, if the court please, uh, this is the great state of California in the United States of America. 
That Frenchified term, attorney, just gets to me, sir. It sticks in my craw. I am just a practical old country lawyer doing what I know best to do, defending somebody who needs proper representation before the law, to the letter of the law. Unhappily, that's someone in need today is me. So I am pressed to do the unthinkable in the eyes of this court. I must represent myself. The prosecutor said the trial will become a circus. If it has been anything different up to this point, that is to say, Your Honor, the audience is tired of this act and quite ready for another. The judge agreed and Darrell went on. This is the time for me to set the words right. For the record, and to clear up this matter, absolutely. I will discuss the issues present, the charges. I will then abide by the court's legal conclusion. But I must speak to the people who would condemn me, for it is these people who must know what has taken place. The prosecutor broke in and said, if Mr. Darrow is who he said he is, a simple country lawyer, why does he take it upon himself to presume to lecture us on his knowledge of the law? The judge fired back. Let the defense speak. Gentlemen, suppose you thought I was guilty. Suppose you thought, just thought so. Would you dare to say by your verdict that scoundrels like the district attorney should be saved from their own sins? by charging those sins to someone else? The prosecutor was angry and objected, but Darrow had already struck. Now, gentlemen, I'm going to be honest with you in this matter. The McNamara case was a hard fight. Here was the district attorney's office with his sleuths. Here was the DeBird Detective Agency with their hounds. Here was the Erector's Association with its gold. A man could not stir out of his house or out of his office without being attacked by those men, ready to commit all sorts of deeds. The prosecutor said it was a gross simplification and misleading, but Darrow was allowed to continue. They had the grand jury. We didn't. They had the police force. We didn't. They had organized government itself. and We didn't. We had to work hard and work fast. We had to work the best we could. And I would like to compare notes with them. The prosecution reminded the judge and the jury that Mr. Darrow's chief jury investigator was arrested for passing a $500 bribe to one of the jury members. Don't forget that. I did not pass $500 in the elevator, as the prosecutor has said. But if I had, I had just as much right to give that $500 for that purpose as I would have to buy $500 worth of hogs. Just exactly. I was doing exactly what they were doing, what Sam Brown says they did. When he testified, they filled our office with detectives. And here comes this wonderful man, so honest, so pure, so high and so mighty, Mr. District Attorney Ford, who says the state has the right to do that, who also says the state has a right to put spies in the camp of the criminal. But the criminal has no right to put spies in their camp. Isn't that wonderful, gentlemen? Here is a contest between two parties in litigation. The prosecution has a right to load us up with spies and detectives and informers. And we cannot put anyone into their office. Now, what do you think of that? Do you, any of you even believe it? 
Other misdeeds were brought up on both sides. But what was in Darrow's heart, we may never really know. For like his friend Lincoln Steffens, Darrow could be very entertaining in giving answers to direct questions. Lincoln Steffens was asked while on the stand, by the way, Mr. Steffens, you are an avowed anarchist, aren't you? His reply was straightforward. Worse than that, I am a believer in Christianity, and that is more radical than anarchy. But was Darrow an anarchist? The high motive of the revolutionist is one side. The strength of the government to protect itself is the other side. Victor Hugo wrote in Les Miserables, when he sends the kind priest of reason with the old dying revolutionist who sat on the porch of his hermit's cottage waiting for the night and death, which were coming side by side then, the priest upbraids him for the cruelty of the revolution. The old man rouses from his dying stupor and says, you speak of the revolution. A storm had been gathering here for 1,500 years. It burst upon us, and you blame the thunderbolt. With the land and the possessions of America rapidly passing into the hands of a favored few, with great corporations taking the place of individual effort, with the small shops going down before the great factories, with thousands of men and women in idleness and want, with wages constantly tending to a lower level, with the number of women and children rapidly increasing in factory and in store, with the sight of thousands of children forced into involuntary slavery at the tender age that should find them at home or in school, with courts sending men to jail, without trial for daring to refuse to work, with bribery and corruption openly charged, constantly reiterated by the press, and universally believed, and above all, and more than all, with the knowledge that the servants of the people, elected to correct abuses, are bought and sold in legislative halls at the bidding of corporations and individuals of great wealth. With all these notorious evils sapping the foundations of popular government and destroying personal liberty, some rude awakening must certainly come. And if it shall come in the lightning and tornado of civil war, the selfsame war of a generation past, when you then looked abroad over the ruin and desolation, remember the long years in which the storm was rising, and do not blame the thunderbolt. The prosecutor said at the end, what does all this have to do with the case? It must have had something to do with it because Darrow was not convicted. The case was declared a mistrial. Now we go to the debate with Judge Alfred J. Talley over capital punishment in New York, 1924, made for amazing entertainment with a strong moral lesson. Ladies and gentlemen, Judge Talley has said tonight that everybody who kills dreads hanging. I know everyone who is taken into court on a murder charge desires to live. But if we are going to make it a deterrent, why not make a good job of it? Make a punishment that is terrible. Why not boil them in oil, as they used to do? Why not burn them at the stake? Why not sew them into a bag of snakes and throw them out to sea? Why not take them out on the sand and let them be eaten by ants? 
Why not break every bone in their body on the rack? As has been done for such serious offenses as heresy and witchcraft. Those were the good old days in which Judge Talley should have held court, when you could kill them by the millions simply because they worshiped God in a different way. Why not bring back the 170 crimes that were punishable by death in England and shaped the very core of their legal system? Why not return to all the tortures that the world has always resorted to to keep men on the straight path? Why reduce it to a paltry question of murder? Today's world is changing because we are growing a little more sensitive, a little more imaginative, a little kindlier. That is all. But why is Darrow opposed to capital punishment? It is too horrible a thing for a state to undertake. We are told by my friend Judge Talley that the killer does it. Why shouldn't the state? I would hate to live in a state that I didn't think was better than a common murderer. But I told you the real reason. The people of the state kill a man because he killed someone else. That is all. Without the slightest logic, without the slightest application to life, without the simple matter of anger and nothing else being dealt with. In the end, the question is one of humane feelings against the brutal feeling. One who likes to see suffering out of what he thinks is a righteous indignation or any other will hold fast to capital punishment. One who has sympathy and imagination and kindness and simple understanding will hate it and detest it as he hates and detests death. In one of his more public cases, Leopold and Loeb, two young defendants, 18 and 19, of rich Chicago gentry, did a killing for the thrill of doing it, a compulsion. They did it, but why take the life of two boys for taking the life of another boy? Your Honor, I've seen this court urged almost to the point of threats to hang two boys in the face of science, in the face of philosophy, in the face of humanity, in the face of experience, in the face of all the better and more human thoughts of the age. This is a senseless, useless, purposeless, motiveless act of two boys. Now let me see if I can prove it. There was not a particle of hate. There was not a grain of malice. There was no opportunity to be cruel, except as death is cruel, and death is cruel. There was no purpose in it, no reason for it, and no motive at all. They pled guilty. And how many times has the state's attorney asked for consideration in a murder case 99 out of 100 times? How many times has the state failed to give consideration to the defendant on a plea, a man, not a boy, not two boys, but a man? and it will be done so long as justice is fairly administered. And what about the matter of crime and punishment? The idea he put forth in the Leopold and Loeb case was an ever-evolving civil society. The more we study and become literate, the more we doubt dispensing severe punishment. Back in the sixth century, if a person was injured in the tribe, then that tribe must injure somebody in the other's tribe. It makes no difference who it is, but somebody 
if one is killed, his friends or family, they must kill in return. Later, in England, when one was convicted, he was taken to the Shire town on a high hill in the presence of a multitude, so that all might see that the wages of sin indeed were death. Let's take a look at the psychology of man and making it personal. If these two boys die on the scaffold, which I can never bring myself to imagine, the details of this will spread over the world. Every newspaper will carry a full accounting. It will enter every home and every family. Will it make us better or worse? Would it make the human heart softer or would it make our hearts colder, harder? less likely to forgive. How many would be colder and crueler for it? What influence would it have upon us? Uh, what influence would it have on the children? The question needs to be answered. You can answer it, Your Honor, from the human heart. Do I need to argue that cruelty only breeds cruelty? That hatred only causes hatred and if there is any way to kill evil and hatred and all that goes with them it is through charity and love and human understanding but how often do we need to be told this will it ever sink in let's put capital punishment to the real test sprinkle in some racism and put it outside the United States. Add misdirection on both sides, a radically motivated early at trial, throw in rape and murder and you have the Massey case. The trial would be a movie in itself. It's Honolulu, 1932. The facts. The wife of a United States Navy officer was brutally beaten and raped by five Japanese soldiers. Four were caught and identified by the victim but later released on the judgment of a first trial. While awaiting a retrial, husband Lieutenant Thomas Massey kidnapped one of the men and beat a confession out of him. When he was told the confession gained in this manner would not hold up in court, he became incensed. Determined to get a confession, armed with a false subpoena, he kidnapped the leader of the assailants, Joseph Kahahawi, took him to the Massey home where he confessed to raping Mrs. Massey. Thomas then killed him. The island was teeming on both sides when Darrow stepped in. He decided the case could be settled on the question of cause and motive being the basis of his argument. How would any one of you have acted had you been placed in this case? Can you imagine anything worse than could have fallen upon this family? They had nothing to do with it, not the slightest. Thomas performed his duties by day and nursed his wife by night. Gentlemen, you asked to send these people to the penitentiary. Do you suppose that if you had been caught in the hands of fate, would you have done differently? No, we are not made that way. Life does not come that way. It comes from a devotion of mothers, of husbands, loves of men and women. That's where life comes from. Without this love, this devotion, the world will be desolate and cold and will take its lonely course around the sun alone. Gentlemen, you have the power to send them away for life. But let me say to you that if on top of all else that has been heaped upon the devoted heads of this family, if they should be sent to prison, it would place a blot upon the fair name of these islands that all the Pacific seas could never wash away. Darrow went on to establish the motive, but the cause was much more elusive. Was premeditation there? Or was the killing performed in a state of momentary insanity? 
there is somewhere deep in the feelings and instincts of a man a yearning for justice, an idea of what is right and what is wrong, of what is fair between man and man that came before the first law was written and will abide after the last one is dead. They did not want to kill. They made no plan to kill. They didn't know what to do when it happened. Oh, we are now realizing that many acts have been punished as crimes that are acts of insanity. Why? Because lawyers have been too cruel to look for insanity because an act is considered as a crime, not as a consequence of cause. Take them not with anger, but with pity and with understanding. But how does the issue of racism play in this case? It is nine years before the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor, and the island of Hawaii is dominated by Japanese. I have looked at this island, which is a new country to me. I've never had any prejudice against any race on earth. I didn't learn it, and I defy anyone to find any word of mine to contradict what I say. To me, these questions of race must be solved by understanding, not by force. I have put this case without appeal to the nationality of race or any juror, asking them to pass on it as a human case. We're all human beings. Take this case with its dire disasters written all over by the hand of fate as a case of your own, and I'll be content with your verdict. What we do is affected by things around us. We're made more than we make. The plea which was broadcast to the mainland lasted four and a half hours and brought tears to the eyes of the listeners. The jury was out for two days, and when they returned, they found them guilty of manslaughter. The verdict started an inquiry and went all the way to President Hoover. And before the Masseys could serve one hour in prison, their sentence was commuted by the governor of the island of Hawaii. It's Dayton, Tennessee, a hot summer, 1925. Robinson's Drugstore and a group of townspeople, including a 24-year-old teacher, Thomas Scopes, were discussing the anti-evolution law when one of the members suggested they test the case. The new law read, quote, be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Tennessee that it shall be unlawful for any teacher in any of the universities, normals, and all of the public schools of the state which are supported in whole or in part by public school funds of the state to teach any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught by the Bible and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals." End quote. Scopes was arrested, and the sleepy little town of Dayton, Tennessee, became a revival meeting and a circus of reporters and an early test of the new medium of radio. Sides in the southern town had already been decided. It wasn't called the Bible Belt for nothing. It would be a duel in the sun between William Jennings Bryan and Clarence Darrow. Your Honor, this is a case at law, and hard as it is for me to bring my mind to conceive it, almost impossible as it is to put my mind back into the 16th century, I am going to argue it as if it was serious, and as if it was a death struggle between two civilizations. Suppose now the legislature should say, we think the religious privileges and duties of the citizens of Tennessee are much more important than education. We agree with the governor of the state. If religion 
must go, or learning must go, why let learning go? And therefore, we will establish a course in public schools of teaching that the Christian religion, as unfolded to us in the Bible, is true, and that every other religion or mode or system of ethics is false. And to carry that out, no person in the public schools shall be permitted to read or hear anything except Genesis. Would that be constitutional? If it is, the Constitution is a lie and a snare, and the people have forgotten what liberty means. The Bible is not one book. The Bible is made up of 66 books written over a period of about a thousand years, some of them very early and some of them comparatively late. It is a book primarily of religion and morals. It is not a book of science, never was and never meant to be. As always. Darrow fired them up on the close of his remarks. This book is the origin of species. If today you can take evolution and make it a crime to teach it in public schools, tomorrow you can make it a crime to teach it in the private schools. And next year you can make it a crime to teach it in church. At the next session, you may ban books and the newspapers. Soon, you may set Catholic against Protestant, Protestant against Protestant, and try to foist your own religion upon the minds of men. If you do one, you can do the other. Ignorance, fanaticism, is ever busy and needs feeding. always it is feeding a gloating for more today it is the public school teacher after a while it is the setting of man against man creed against creed until with flying banners and beating drums we are marching backwards to the glorious ages of the 16th century when bigots lighted faggots to burn the men who dared to bring any intelligence and enlightenment and culture to the human mind. In the course of the Scopes trial, Brian took the stand in defense of the Bible. Darrow's cross-examination, which was heard on radio, was wild and showed Brian to be blind to practical elements of science. However, the judge ordered Brian's testimony stricken from the record. At that moment, Darrow asked the jury to come in, and the judge instructed the jury if they found Scopes guilty, he would impose a $100 fine. The verdict was guilty. On a technicality, the highest court of Tennessee finally ordered the case dismissed, and science still prevails. Now, what about today, and what will become of this great country of ours tomorrow? Have we truly become more sensitive and more aware of the human condition? Or have we turned more ruthless in our quest for money and power? Things to ponder, Mr. Darrell.